Masechet Kitin Daf Samech Het. We have two fantastic stories today. We just saw a story about Rav Amram, who was tortured by the people of the house of the Resh Galuta. They left him, they forced him to sleep in the snow. And so now we're going to have another story of a similar theme. Amad le Resh Galuta le Rav Sheshat. My tamad la sa'ed mor gaban. So the Resh Galuta told Rav Sheshat, um, how come you're not coming and eating with us? Uh, you know, if you get an invitation from the Resh Galuta, you better come, otherwise it's seen as a, an insult. And so there was some tension here. How come you're not coming over? He said, because the uh, servants in your house oh, do not have a high standard, and I suspect them of serving Ever min hachai, serving non-kosher. So the Resh Galuta says, where'd you get that from? I'll show you. Right? Invite me over. I'm going to prove it to you. Genov, I tell you, Hada Kara me Hevata. So Rav Sheshat tells one of his servants, Go sneak into the uh, um, house of the Resh Galuta, steal a leg, one leg from one animal, and bring it to me. Aitile. So they did, they brought it to him. Amalehu, Ahadmu li Hadme de Hevata, Aitu Tilat Kare, O Tibu Kame. So now Rav Sheshat is in the home of the Resh Galuta, and so the servants are there and they're serving him. And Rav Sheshat says, um, Please bring out all the different portions of the animal, right? I, want, I don't just want, I don't, I don't want just one portion. I want to see all of the pieces of the animal that you slaughtered. So they brought it out, and there, there was only had three legs. So Rav Sheshat says, um, this, this animal that you slaughtered, did it only have three legs? And so one of the servants, they saw that, and quickly, to cover up the fact that there were only three legs, they went to another living animal, and they cut off one leg from that animal and put it before him. Okay, so the servants think that they're, uh, they're tricking Rav Sheshat, but really he is a step ahead of them. So then Rav Sheshat told the servant, bring that leg that you had stolen uh, here, and he brought it and put it uh, and put it together with all the others. So he said, this animal that you slaughtered, does it have now Five legs? Okay, this is pretty funny. So now the Resh Galuta realized that the Rav Sheshat has a point and uh, his servants cannot be trusted. And, you know, when uh, if they're uh, in uh, a, 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 a difficult situation, they will go ahead and cut an animal off of a live, uh, cut a, a limb off of a live animal and serve it. So uh, Resh Galuta says, okay, you know what? Come over and and um, I will have the servants prepare the meal right in front of you, and you can see everything. You be the mashkiach, uh, hibachi style, and then you will eat it. So he said, fine, I will do that. So now you can imagine the servants, uh, now Rav Sheshat made them look bad. So the servants don't like Rav Sheshat very much. And it's always a bad idea to insult your waiter or the chef, anyone who's serving you food. Um, so the servants go and um, they brought a table before them, meaning a tray, right? That uh, a low table that they would eat off of, and they brought the meat in front of him. Now the servant, I had to prepare it in front of him, but the servants managed to sneak in a small bone in the meat. It's called a bone that chokes people, uh, that chokes uh, uh, bl- uh, um, blind people. Rav Sheshat, by the way, was blind, and so they put this small bone in it, and even though he was blind, he was able to feel it. And it says, "Oh, they." They put this uh, dangerous bone in here. So he put the, he took the entire piece. He didn't want to call it out right then. He wanted to set them up. So Rav Sheshat took the entire piece of meat, wrapped it up in a, uh, a kerchief. And so it would look like he had eaten it, but really he was hiding it in this napkin. Um, okay. Le batar de achil. So then after he ate, the servants, they, 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 they realized that, well, he didn't choke to death. Um, and, um, 
Uh, and uh, so they uh, they saw they saw what what happened, and so they go. The servant said, "Tell the uh, the the galuta, lan kasa de chaspa." They said, "A silver cup was stolen from us. We have to check everything." They did this as a setup in order to be able to check everything, including that napkin of Rav Sheshat. And so they checked. They opened up the napkin and. They they found the piece of meat in it. So now the Rav Sheshat looks bad. So the uh, servants told the Resh Galuta, see, he doesn't come to eat, even though we prepared everything right in front of him, and he can assert everything's kosher. He's coming and just to, just to make fun of us, just, just to torture us. Uh, after everything that we did for him, right? Look how he treats you. He refuses to eat from you. He won't get take any benefit from you because he hates you. See, says, "Not true. I did eat it. I tasted it." And when I tasted it, it tasted bad. That there was uh, leprosy in it, um, and that's why I put it away. The Reshkaluta says we did not prepare meat that had uh, white spots on it that was diseased. Go, go and check uh, the, the 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 source of it. Go check the skin. From that animal, um, Rav Chista said, if you find black spots on white skin or white spots on black skin, that means that it's infected. They checked and they found that it was infected, and um, uh, so once again, Rav Sheshat outsmarted the servants, and now the servants are even more angry that they, he made them look bad. So they're going to set another trap, this uh, little tra- literal trap. Um, Rav Shashat was leaving the house, so they uh, dug a pit um, and they put a reed mat on top of it. Now, Rav Shashat actually was blind, so he wouldn't see the pit anyway, even if there was no reed mat. Okay, but anyway, they was ho- they were hoping that he would fall into the pit. Amri le le temor le nach. So then uh, they said, Rav Sheshat, oh, you know, why don't you come and rest for a while? Nechale, uh, uh, you know, so come down this hallway and you can rest. They, they look like they're being nice. Nechale Rav Chista me'achore. Rav Chista saw what was going on. He couldn't say it outright because then it's going to make the Rish Galuta look bad. So he snorted, giving a hint, right? Something, danger. So because of that danger, he didn't know exactly what it was, but Rav Sheshat said, went to a child and said, And the kid happened to be studying Shemuel Bet, and so he quoted the Pasuk, turn to your right or to your left. This was a common way of uh, called necrom- uh, bibliomancy. Um, necromancy is asking from things from the dead, which is totally prohibited. Bibliomancy, Rambam also says is prohibited to make a decision based on that. Um, but, uh, okay, maybe here he was just uh, looking for a hint, but not making a decision based on it. Um, anyway, the kid said, go to the right or to the left, meaning don't walk straight. So now he tells his servant, Rav Sheshat's servant, do you see anything? What do you see? And say, I see a mat on the ground. Um, that's why they had to put a mat, because even though Rav Sheshat was blind, other people, his servant, who's showing him around, will see it and uh, stop it. So uh, he says, I see a mat on the ground. Rav Sheshat put everything together. Okay, he snorted. Rav Chista snorted. He said, the kid said you should go to the right or left. There's a mat on the ground. So he told the servant, let's go around it. And so he successfully went around it and did not fall. After Rav Sheshat left, Rav Chista was, I was surprised. How did you know that they uh, dug, dug a trap for you? First of all, you gave me a heads up because you snorted. And second, the child told me right or left. And I also do uh, suspected his servants of not acting according to the uh, high standard. Uh, that's what the story started with. He don't. He doesn't trust them. And sure enough, he was correct not to trust them. And so that's a story that is a follow-up and similar to the uh, servants of the Rej Galuta that tortured Rav Amram and threw him out into the snow. All right. And now we have a very long and uh, famous story 
a, an important story. Um, it will um, involve a, a, a blind person in the middle of it, but uh, that's not why it's here. It's here because we were talking about demons. And so this is, um, where, that was the, the source of the, um, uh, that heart disease, mind disease, um, and uh, that the, the temporary insanity uh, that was caused by a certain demon. And so now we have a story about demons. עשיתי לי שרים ושרות ותענוגות בני אדם שידה ושידות. פסוק אין קהלת, where King Shalomo says, I got everything in the world, all forms of good things and pleasures and entertainment. And I got uh, שרים ושרות, male singers and female singers, and the pleasures, and then שידה uh, ושידות. This is going to be, we have to explain that. So שרים ושרות אלו מיני זמר. So this is talking about different types of musical instruments that are usually played by men and played by women. וְתַעַנְוֹגֹת בְּנֵי אָדָם אֶלוּ בְּרֵחוֹת וּמֶרֶחֶסָאֹת and the pleasures refers to pools and bathhouses. שִׁדָה וְשִׁדָת הַחַת תַרְגִּמוּ שִׁדָה וְשִׁדְתִין וְמַרָבָה אַמְרֵי שִׁדְתָה and the, these words mean male demons and female demons. In Eretz Yisrael they say it refers to carriages, but they were in Bavel, so we're going to go with the demon uh, interpretation. אמר רבי יוחנן שלוש מאות מיני שדים היו בשיחין ושידה עשמה איני יודע מהי רבי יוחנן who is from Eretz Yisrael says there were 300 types of demons in a place called שיחין and a demon I don't really know what it is demonology was a lot more popular in the Persian Empire in Bavel than in Eretz Yisrael. Amar mor, hacha targimu shida v'shidetin. So uh, they, uh, we, we just quoted that we, the, it was interpreted here in Bavel that is referring to um, demons, male, male and female. Shida v'shidetin lema iba aele. So now the question is, these don't fit, seem to fit into the uh, theme of the pasuk that he has all kinds of pleasurable things, bathhouses, instruments. That makes sense, but demons. Why would King Shalomo require any demons? Uh, okay, good question. And now we're going to have a long story to answer that. Um, uh, says the house was the Bet Mikdash when it was built. It was built of stone that was made ready at the quarry. Right? In other words, they didn't cut the stones on site at the in Yerushalayim, but rather at the quarry. Right? Because you cannot have any uh, hammer, axe, no iron tool can be heard in the Bet Mikdash. So the simple reading is that they would cut them with iron tools at the quarry and make them all nice and straight and perfect size and then they would bring them so that there was no banging iron tools that are associated with uh, uh, weapons none of that would have would be in the uh, in the temple okay so that's a simple reading um, that they did use it back at the site but let's say you say that you can't use iron tools at all, tools at all then how are you going to cut the stones for the Beit HaMikdash. So, Shalom asked the rabbis, what should I do? How should I cut the stones? So, um, they, the rabbis answered, oh, there's this creature, it's called a shamir, some kind of a snail thing, and it, uh, it miraculously can cut through stones. Moshe Rabbeinu used it to cut the stones of the ephod. This, mentions, this uh, uh, Shamir is not mentioned in the Tanakh. It's mentioned in Pirkei Avot as one of the ten things that was created um, on Friday afternoon during Ben Hashem Ashot. It's kind of a miraculous thing that is embedded in, in creation. So Shalom says, I need one of those. I need to build a better Mikdash. Where is it? Uh, so they, the uh, rabbis told him, um, you know what? We don't know where it is, but demons know where it is. Bring a male and female demon, torture them until they reveal where it is. So he did, he birthed them and tortured them, and then they said, we don't know where it is, but maybe Ashmedai, who is the king of the demons, and maybe he's, he knows where it is. Okay, Ashmedai is well-known uh, uh, demon. Uh, Asmedaius, he's mentioned in Persian sources, he's mentioned in the book of Tobit. 
which is one of the uh, Sefarim Chitzonim, the Apocrypha. Um, a great story, and you could read that. And so this was a well-known demon. Um, okay, uh, demons, by the way, in general, in, uh, in Persia, in Persian uh, writings, are not always evil. Sometimes they're kind of, you know, sometimes they're actually even helpful or mischievous, right, but not really pure evil. Uh, demons in the Roman Empire are seen more as absolutely evil, a source of all bad things. Okay, so we'll see here a kind of combination of this Ashmedai and what kind of uh, character he was. Amalehu hecha ite, Shalomo asked the rabbis, where is Ashmedai? Amri le ite betura pelan. So they told him he's on this mountain, that's where he lives. Okay, kadya le bira umalya le maya umikasya betinara vechatme begush banke. Now we learn a little bit about what Ashmedai, what he does and how he lives. He dug a pit for himself there, filled it with water, covered it with a rock, and sealed it with a seal. Vechol yom asalik le rakia vegaman metin Every day, Ashmedai goes up to the heavenly yeshiva and he studies Torah there. You see what kind of an amazing demon this is? He is a Tamid Chacham demon. Okay, this is fantastic. And then he comes down to earth and he studies in the Bet Midrash down on earth. Um, uh, there's a, 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 another Gemara that says, you know, when there's a lot of people in the Bet Midrash and you feel, you know, something, this, uh, uh, um, uh, this pressure around your legs, you know, what is that? This is, oh, that's the demons. They come to the Bet, Bet Midrash too. And Ashmedai comes and he is, he learns from up in heaven and he learns from Torah from the sages down on earth. And then he comes and he gets thirsty. So he comes and checks the seal, make sure nobody opened it and poisoned it. And But he's, he knows he can uncover it. He uncovers, drinks from it. And he covers it again and then he goes. That's his daily routine. He drinks, he he. He learns Torah and he drinks water from this special place. So he's always going to come back here. All right. Now, Shadre le Benayahu ben Yehoyada. Shalomo sent Benayahu. He was one of the uh, 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 commanders. Um, and his name, Benayahu, comes from Livnot. And so that this that Midrashic Association means that Shalomo appointed him to, uh, bu- to be in charge of building the Bet HaMikdash. And so that's why he sent Benayahu to go and get Ashmedai so that we can find the uh, Shamir. Now, King Shalomo gave him a couple of items he's going, to, he's going to need, a chain that God's sacred name was carved into this chain, and a ring, Shalomo's own ring, that also had Hashem's name carved into it. Very powerful weapons. Um, and he also gave him fleeces of wool and wineskins full of wine. We'll see why he needs all these things. Azal kera bera mitata u shafin hu lemaya u stamin hu big babe de amra. So Benayo, he knew he can't open the seal because then. Uh, then uh, uh, the Ashmedai will notice. Instead, he dug underneath and he drained all the water out, plugged it up with the fleeces, with the fleeces of wool. And then he dug another pit above, higher up, above his pit, and he poured the wine into it and he plugged, uh, he, he, pl- he plugged up uh, both of the pits and he went and sat in a tree. In other words, he didn't dis- disturb the seal, but he was able by going on, on, on the side, kind of like a safe in a bank, you know, you can't get, get into the front door, they'll see it, but you can sometimes drill into the side of it. Okay, so he places the water with wine, and now he goes and hides to see what will happen. Ki Medai came after studying Torah the whole day, and he checks the seal. It was good. He opens it up, and he sees that it's wine. Okay, so all that trouble to, <laughs> all that trouble to uh, hide the fact that he changed the liquid didn't help, because you can still tell this is wine, not water. 
אמר כתיב לסייין הומה שחר וכל שוגה בו לא יחכם. So now the reason Nashmedai doesn't want to drink it isn't only because someone switched it and I don't know who knows what they put in it, but actually because it's wine. And the Pasuk in Mishle, you see Ashmedai knows this, he knows not, not only Torah Shebaal Peh, he knows Torah Shebaal too. And he knows it says in Mishle, wine is a mocker, strong drink is riotous, whoever wallows in it is not wise. Says harlotry, wine and new wine take away the heart. So he says, wine is not good for me. And I know it will weaken my wisdom. I'm not going to drink it. La ishte. Kisache la sagele ishte rava ugna. But then he got very thirsty and he couldn't resist. He was so thirsty. So he drank. He got drunk and he fell asleep. And that was Benayahu's plan the whole time. Nachit ata sheda be shilta setame. So Benayahu went and he got that chain and tied Ashmedai up. Ki it ad hava ka mi parzal. Amar le shema de marach alach. Shema de marach alach. Um, when Ashmedai awoke, he tried to get out. He's pulling on the chains. But he says, be careful. The name of, a, of the master is upon you, meaning Hashem's name. Right? Don't, you, can't, you can't tear the chain. Um, I, you could think of it in two ways. Number one, that this is a very strong chain and has like magical powers of strength because it has God's name on it. Second, if you break it, then that will break Hashem's name. And he can't do that. Okay, what you see from this is that even though Ashmedai is very, very powerful, nevertheless, he is, uh, he is below HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? The, um, Rabin, even though the rabbis seem that they do believe in, in uh, demons, it's hard to know what, of this, what part of this to take literally or not. We would probably take none of it literally, but the question is the rabbis themselves, did they take belief in demons literally or do they represent something? It's a big question. Ramchal says you should not take these stories literally. These are um, hidden uh, lessons. And we could think about at the end what might be the hidden lesson that is embedded within this story. Okay, anyway, the point is that in, um, according to the rabbis, even if you think that the rabbis did believe in demons and did believe in Ashmedai, um, which maybe they didn't even at all, they're just using them as characters, but even if they did take uh, the b- demonology literally, they still think that these are lower beings um, below HaKadosh Baruch Hu that Hashem created in order to do His biddings. You can believe in angels, so you can believe in demons too. Okay, ki nakit le ve'ate meta dikla haf be shadye, meta le beta shadye, meta gabe kuba hahi al malta nefka ihanena le. So now Benayah was taking Ashmedai out and he's bringing him, he caught him. He's bringing him to Yerushalayim, to King Shalomo. Now, when ben, uh, when uh, Ashmedai um, reached the palm tree, he rubbed it a little and knocked it down. That's how strong he was, even though he's in chains. chains. He reached the house and bumped into it and knocked it down. And then there was a small shack that would have been nothing. It would have been, right, he could have uh, 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 blow on it and it will, it will fall down. But the small shack belonged to a widow. And the widow saw Ashmedai coming, knocking down trees and houses, and she was afraid for her little shack. And so she came and begged, please don't knock down my shack. And amazingly, Ashmedai, number one, now we know he's a, he's a Tamit Chacham. He learns from in the heavens and the earth. And look, he has, he cares about the um, plea of this poor widow. And so he bent his body away from her and her shack so that she, he wouldn't break it. And because he went that way, he broke one of his bones. Ashmedai, he had to contort himself and caused himself to break a bone. And this is a fulfillment of the Pasuk, that soft speech can break a bone. How can soft speech break a bone? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but uh, words can never hurt me. Not true. Words can even break a bone. How so? Because look at this poor widow, and just by saying nice words and, and begging, please don't leave my house alone. Alone, that caused this uh, mighty being to uh, to cause himself to break a bone in order to spare her. All right, so so far Ashmedai is looking like a pretty good character. Okay, Haza Samya Tehavaka Na Ta'e Beorha. Ashmedai saw a blind man lost on the road. Asikele Orha Ashmedai helped him. 
uh, and to get to the to the correct road. Here's the blind person, right? Ashbedai, much better than the servants of the Resh Galuta, right? Who try to trick a blind person. He saw a drunk person lost on the road, and Ashbedai helped him. Here, you're going the wrong way. Here's how you get home. He saw a wedding celebration, and Ashbedai cried. He's so romantic. We'll see in a second why he's really. Um, uh, doing all these things. He saw someone go to a shoemaker and he says, Get, make me a real top quality pair of shoes that will last me for seven years. Ashmedai laughed. He saw a magician doing magic and Ashmedai laughed at him. Okay. Ashmedai arrived in Yerushalayim and he expected they're going to bring him, come, bring him to come see King Shalomo. But they kept him in a separate room for three days, didn't bring him. So he's wondering, Ashmedai asked the servants, how come the king is not uh, bringing me to see him? Oh, because he drank too much, he got drunk and he was not in a state. To meet you. Um, okay, so there's too much drinking. See, there's a parallelism here between Ashmedai and King Shalomo. Remember that. I think that is the key to unraveling the may subtle or not so subtle message of this uh, of this story. Ashmedai took one brick and put it on top of another brick. Um, we don't know why he did that, but the servants saw him doing that, and they said there must be some deep wisdom here. Maybe he was just playing with bricks. So they told uh, the servants told Shlomo, and Shlomo said, "Oh, I know what he's saying. He's saying give the king more to drink, right? Um, if he, I guess he enjoys drinking." So give him another drink, put one brick on top of another. And so the next day, Ashmedai also was invited. He asked the servants, how come the king did not uh, bring, uh, uh, want me to come today? He ate too much and uh, he was too full, stomach ache, and he, you know, he just took a nap. Um, and the uh, point, he ate too much. Um, what you see here, a common theme is uh, materialism and overdoing it, right? King Shalomo, he can't function. He says a really important thing he needs to do. He wants to build a better mikdash. Okay, wonderful. He needs to get a Shamir. Okay, good. He asks the rabbis. Good. He does all the steps and then finally gets Ashmedai and he's drinking too much, he's eating too much, getting distracted from the important holy work that he has to do. And so Ashmedai takes the brick um, uh, that was on top, one, one upon the other, and he takes the brick off the other brick and puts it on the ground. I wonder if Ashmedai's uh, um, a hint here is that, you know, you should be building the Beit HaMikdash. And then he says, a second day, you're still doing nothing, so he takes it off. See, you're not building the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, maybe that's what Ashmedai meant. I don't know. But the servants told Shalomo that he took one brick off the other, and Shalomo says, I know what he's saying. Take food away from him, right? Don't feed Shalomo too much so he doesn't stuff himself and then can't meet again. Finally, after three days, the servants figured out how to regulate his drinking and eating. And now he said, okay, come. Shekal kanya umshach arba'a garmidi ushta kameh. Um, Ashmedai this time did another demonstration. He took a reed, measured four cubits long, um, right, uh, a, a cubit, so about, uh, no, six feet long. So he brings this reed measured four cubits, throws it in front of King Shalomo. And Ashmedai says to the king, um, see, look, the, you, Shalomo, that man, meaning you, are going to die. And you will have nothing in the world except for the four cubits of your grave. That's the meaning of the of the of the reed. That's four cubits long, right? Um, so you know, you're, all this material good 
is going to be for nothing. This is the key theme throughout the uh, book of Kohelet that we started with. All right, I got everything. And if you look there in the context, a couple of Pesukim later, right, it says, and it's all for naught. Everything is Hebel. Everything, all, all material pleasures are just fleeting and temporary and worthless. So uh, that's one point. And now he says, listen, you conquered the whole world and still you're not satisfied till you conquer me. Ashmedai is saying, like, what, 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 do you, what else do you need? What am I here for? Why are you, why did you capture me? Shlomo says, I don't need anything from you. I have all the riches. I have everything in the world. But I do need something. I want to build a Bet HaMikdash and I need the Shamir. You know where it is. Ashmedai says, it was not given to me. It was given to the minister of the sea. Hashem made it, created it. And gave it to the uh, minister of the sea. And the minister of the sea doesn't give it out to just anyone. He only gives it out to uh, to wild roosters, um, and uh, that he trusts it. And he makes the wild rooster make an oath that they will use it for whatever they need it for and return it to him. As to I can't get it. I can't even get it myself. Okay, umay avad ve, and uh, now what does the rooster do with it? Why does the rooster need a shamir? What are they digging through? Mamtile le ture de let behu yishu, manachla ashina de tura o paka tura, umenakit maite biz rane me ilane, veshade hatam behave yishuv. The roosters, they go to mountains that uh, there's nobody living there, not fit for habitation, and they take the shamir, they put it on the craggy rock, the mountain splits, and then the rooster goes bring seeds of trees, throws them around there, and then trees grow and it becomes fit for habitation. What a beautiful thing. They're, they're growing hab- ha- 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 habitable uh, land uh, that animals can come and people come. Uh, this is good for the world. It's also good for the roosters themselves because then there'll be more uh, stuff for them to go and um, uh, and find food um, from uh, from whatever grows there and whatever the people and animals leave over there. Okay, v'hainu demetargeminan nagar tura, and that's why this the word duchifat, uh, which is this kind of bird, is is translated as cutter of mountains because this duchifat bird, this type of wild rooster, um, is able to t- get the shamir and that's its purpose, that's its goal. It makes, uh, it makes land more ha- um, habitable so that there can be more life there and more food and so this is a very important item that they need the shamir for. But kukina de tanergola bara de it le bene. So now they're going to have to go and catch a shamir from a rooster. So they went and found a nest of a wild rooster and there were chicks inside. And so they're using the chicks as bait for the, um, for the rooster to come and get a shamir. So they covered the nest with with a see-through glass. And so the rooster sees, sees his chicks, the rooster cares about his chicks, right, tries to get them, bangs into the glass, does the old right bird flying into the glass trick, and uh, realizes that there is something there and cannot he cannot get to his uh, uh, babies. So, ki hava ba'el me'al ve'la maseh, azal aite shamira ve'otbe ilave. So this uh, rooster goes and he went to get the shamir. And his, he He's uh, authorized to because he goes to the sea, uh, the minister of the sea, promises that he will return it, and so he went so that he could break through the glass. See, it's all set up so the rooster would get it. And now, just then, So the Shalomo servant uh, took a clump of dirt, threw it at the rooster, distracted him. The rooster knocked over the shamir. The servant went and took the shamir. And when the rooster saw that, he was so upset that he wasn't able to return the shamir and keep his oath. The The rooster committed suicide. Okay, uh, it's interesting that the rooster 
can even do that. I'm not sure how they can strangle themselves. Um, but this rooster did. Okay, now they have the Shamir intact. So really, Ashmedai can leave the picture. But Ashmedai is still part of the rest of the plot because he's the main character. Um, or may, maybe Shalomo is the main character. Or maybe, right, they need each other here um, because one is a foil for the other. Anyway, Ben Ayahu goes to Ashmedai and says, you know, now thanks for your help, but I'm curious about all the things that you did on the way. How come you saw that blind man and you helped him go to the right road? Right? Why were you helping him? Says, I went up to heaven. I know, I know. In heaven, they've made a proclamation that this blind person is very righteous and anyone who does something good for him will merit the world to come. So I wanted some merit. Right? He, a demon also wants to do good things. Okay, this is a good reason. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, uh, for personal benefit, but still, he helped out a blind person because it was a righteous person. How come when you saw a drunk guy, how come you also helped him a lot uh, to go on the right road? Oh, he, he uh, declared in heaven that he is a very wicked man. And so, I did something good for him so that he can use up all of his reward. Even a very evil person does a few good things. Let him get all his reward here in this world so that he has no reward in the world to come. Okay, in these two scenes, right, you see we're dealing with uh, Sadiq Vedat law, Rasha Vitov law, right? Everything is for a reason. And ultimately, Moral good and evil will be compensated, right, with uh, uh, with reward and punishment. And so here you see that materialism is all futile and nonsense and vain. But deeds, being sadiq or rasha, that is that is recorded. And up in heaven, that is what people care about. Ashmedai is in touch with people's righteousness and evil. And so, you know, if uh, when you see uh, uh, an evil person get some good in the world, right, it's only because uh, it will lead to more, more ultimate destruction for him. My ta'ama ki chazite lahu chedvata bachit. And Benel now asks, how come when you saw that wedding, how come you cried at the wedding? Right? Were you so so emotional that they're getting married? He said, the groom, I know, is going to die within 30 days. And she, not only is she going to lose her husband, she's not going to have children yet. And there, this, he has a brother who's going to be a Yavam. But that brother was only born short, a short time ago, and uh, a, a minor cannot do Yibum or Chalitza until they're 13 years old, she, meaning she's going to be stuck as, as an Aguna for 13 years. So it looks like this is a perf- picture-perfect wedding, and everybody's uh, um, happy and dancing, but he's crying because he knows that this poor bride is gonna is in for a very difficult uh, future for many years to come. Uh, so you see, Ashmedai has a, um, a an emotional side and cares about the suffering of a bride. Um, how come you saw a man asking a shoemaker to make shoes for seven years and you laughed at him? Says, I know this guy, the customer, he's not going to live for seven days. He wants shoes for seven years? Now this is laughing at the frailty of mankind. We think we're here to stay and you you know, we go and build things and, and save up and, you know, as if we're, we're here permanently. And uh, this guy, if only he knew, he's not going to live seven days, right? And he would realize that trying to build something permanent is impossible and ha- it leads to leads to um, nothing that nothing permanent. My ta'ama ki chazite lahu kasma dava kasim achit. How come you saw that magician make a do a magic trick? How come you laughed at him? Amar le dava yatib abe gaza de malkav liksom mai deika tute. He says because he was he, while he's doing the magic trick, he's sitting on the king's treasure. 
and he doesn't even realize he's using a magic trick right, to reveal something that's not there, right? Oh, where, you know, see this? Where did it go? I'm going to make it appear as if he can see hidden things. But he happens to be sitting right on top of a treasure, a whole box of treasure, and he doesn't even know it, right? So people think they're so wise because they're, you know, they could do a little magic trick and they're missing the point. You can understand this also kind of metaphorically that uh, sometimes we can be um, sitting on real treasure, Torah, mitzvot, really good things that are truly good and last, good deeds. And instead, we're trifling with, um, uh, with uh, a fancy car, a nice uh, a bathhouse, um, and things that are just nonsense. So Shalomo kept Ashmedai until he finished the Bet HaMikdash. I don't know why, he doesn't really need him anymore because he has the Shamir and he, you know, he knows how to get it. But I guess he liked having uh, the um, Ashmedai captive. Um, and, uh, you know, you wonder at this point, well, who's, who's, the, who's the good and who's the bad, right? Um, Ashmedai, so far, he, uh, uh, it's true, he, he makes fun of frailties and nonsense that people get themselves into, but so does, that's the message of Kohelet, that's the message of a lot of, the, a lot of pl- uh, um, statements th- throughout the, the Torah. Um, whereas King Shalomo, he's just, he uh, captured, he captured those demons, tortured them, keeps Ashmedai for no reason, so Shalomo, what are you doing, right? And so it, I think we're blurring the the um, the identification of who is righteous and who is not, and maybe the demon is more righteous than the king. So now King Shalomo and Ashmedai are alone together. And they're speaking about Torah, and the King Shalomo asks Ashmedai, it says in Sefer um, B'midbar, for, uh, for him like lofty horns of a wild ox. And so, and the Midrash says about that, um, that Ketoafot, that's referring to the power of the angels. The M is referring to the power of demons. So he says, Ketoafot, the M, the M, it comes after Tafot, the M is in somehow, somehow greater. It says, demons, you have greater power than the angels. What is the great power that you guys have? Um, what's the, can you show me your power? Okay, so you see King Shalomo, even though he has everything and he's the king and all that, he's curious about this, you know, the dark arts. Um, what can you do? says, I'm happy to show you. Problem is, I'm chained up, right? So if you take, uh, take the chains with God's name uh, off of me, give me your ring, give me that ring that you have. Now this ring, remember, he gave it to Benayahu, and now um, Benayahu actually didn't use it for anything that we see. Maybe he used it to magically make holes in the mountain. Whatever, we, he gave it back to Shalomo. So uh, Ashmedai says, give me, I'm going to take off these chains, give me that ring, and I'll show you the uh, great power that I have. Uh, King Shalomo is supposed to be the very, very wise, but this is not, this is not the smartest thing to do. Um, Shalomo says, yeah, okay, that's a good idea. I can totally trust you, right? I, I'll take off your chains and I'll give you my signet ring with Hashem's name on it. Sure, what could go wrong? Ashmedai swallowed the ring and he, he was able to outstretch himself and had one wing in heaven, one wing on earth, like encompassing all the powers of everything in the universe. And it's about that that Shalomo said in Kohelet, what profit is there for all the toil that someone does under the sun? Um, be, uh, sorry, I missed a line. Um, Shilo, Ashmedai took Shalomo and threw him 400 Persian miles, par- parsangs away. Um, in other words, he kicked Shalomo out. Um, as he's stretching out, Shalomo, goodbye. And now Shalomo is exiled. He lives in, who knows, in the middle of nowhere. And Shalomo is walking around with nothing, you know, not a cent to his name. Nobody knows who he is. And see, he says, all that, all this trouble that I did, I became king and I had everything in the world. And in one split second, just one um, a bad decision, 
um, and he loses everything. What's the point of, of, of the whole world and all this material uh, that people work for? Okay. And the pasuk that says, this is my portion from all of my toil. This is a, a, a pasuk, a two pasukim after the opening pasuk that we started with to begin uh, at the beginning of the story. So you see that this is all inclusio, it's all related. Uh, so this, this is ze, this is my portion. Ze is always referring, pointing to something. What is it talking about? Rav Ushmuel had amar maklo, had amar gundom, a maklo, okay? Uh, Rav and Shemuel, once is referring to his staff and one referring to his cloak. He still had he was his cloak, he was wearing it, or his staff, right? Zeh, this is all I have left. I mean, the staff, when you're actually the king and you're in the palace, the staff is very, shows as a symbol of your power, the cloak also. But when you're walking in the middle of nowhere, then it's just a piece of wood, it's just a piece of cloth, doesn't help at all. And so he would go from door to door, he had to beg for charity just to eat, and he would say, I am Kohelet, I would gather people together, I was the king over Israel in Yerushalayim. It could be that this Midrash is building off of this Hayiti. What do you mean Hayiti? Right? I was. And if you look at the simple reading of the of the Tanakh, I mean, he wasn't king when he was born, but he became king, and he would remain king until he died. So when would when would Shalomo have said, I used to be king? It must be he was king, and he was deposed. So this is one of the, a source for this whole Midrash. So he managed, he kept saying this, and everybody thought this was some, some crazy guy saying, I'm the king, I was the king. But then he managed to get to the Sanhedrin. And the rabbi said, even an imbecile, even a crazy person, doesn't fixate on one thing all the time. If someone's delusional, they usually make up different things. I'm Superman, I'm Batman, I'm the king, I'm the right, I'm an astronaut. Right? You make up different things. But he's very fixated, he's very focused on um, who he thinks he is. Maybe there's something to it. Let's test out what the the king who is who was actually in the palace let's see if he's really the king so now did the king ever um uh, call you in they said no so, so that's curious right since benayahu was the one that went and arrested ashmedai you, you could understand why ashmedai would um, not need benayahu's help and they might recognize him and uh, call them out. And so, no, he never, never called me. Uh, so the Sanhedrin went and interviewed the queens. And they said, did the king ever come with you to be intimate with you? Yes, he does come. He says, uh, listen, can you check his feet? Because um, uh, demons have uh, chicken feet, not human feet, right? So check his feet. Shalhu lehu bemoke kaate. He says, We can. He always comes in socks. <laughs> I think this is the funniest line of maybe the whole story. Um, right? So we don't see his feet. He knows he's hiding his feet. He's always wearing socks. And then the queens go and say, you know, he acts very, pretty strange. Number one, he um, he wants to have relations with us while we are um, in Nida, not, not permitted, um, and he does it anyway. He, and, and he even has uh, relations with Batsheva, his own mother, Shalomo's mother. And that's curious, Shalomo would not do that, but this, whatever, whoever this is, does do it. At this point, based on this testimony of Benayahu and the queens, the Sanhedrin realized that the king is a pretender. And Shalomo, this uh, beggar who came and told them, I am the king, they realized that he was really the king. So they brought Shalomo and they gave him the his signet ring and the chain with God's name on it. Um, uh, and uh, Shalomo entered the palace, Ashmedai saw him, and Ashmedai ran away. So and Ashmedai is still scared because now he doesn't have that power of Hashem's name anymore, right? So that's another theme here that it's Hashem's name, Hashem's power. That's the ultimate power in the whole world. And even, you know, the greatest king and even the greatest demon uh, are all subservient to 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu. V'afilu hachi havale bi'atu temine. Even though King Shalomo had the ring and the Ashmedai ran away from him still, Shalomo was afraid his entire rest of his life. V'ainu dikhtib, hine mitato shel Shalomo, shishim giborim sabib la mi gibore Yisrael, kulam achuzi acherim melum bide milchama, ish harbo al yerecho, bipachad balelot, and this is uh, what the Pasuk says in Shia Shirim, that the bed of Shalomo was surrounded by 60 strong men and warriors, all of them holding swords, trained in war um, because of the fear of the night, especially at night, that's when the demons um, really come out. And so King Shalomo was afraid for his whole life, even though he had everything and all that, and even had these guards, but still he's always afraid. Um, that's the end of the story. Another we saw one in the middle. One says that the King Shalomo, first he was a king and then he became a commoner and he never became a king again but this this uh, story follows the other opinion that he was a king then he became a commoner but then he became a king again when he convinced the Sanhedrin and he came back and uh, and uh, threw Ashmedai out so one theme is Hashem's power. Another theme is the, about wisdom, the wisdom of the sages, right? The sages are really in charge. They know how to distinguish between good and bad, right and wrong, true and false. Um, but the main, thing, the, the main theme is uh, a, a subtle, not so subtle critique of King Shalomo, which is already in Sefer Melachim itself. He is wise. Uh, yes, that's true. And he has all, all the potential and possibilities for being the greatest king ever. However, he does take to, on too many wives. Uh, Ashmedai himself is not the greatest Sadiq. I mean, even though he does a lot of good things, um, he does take all these, uh, the queens. Now, he is a demon after all, and demons are not, uh, um, uh, halakha does not uh, apply to demons. So, it's not that, uh, you know, I don't know if that, how much of a negative this is about Ashmedai, if he's not bound by halakha. Um, uh, but the problem is that King Shalomo, he goes and takes wives that he is not supposed to take. Too many wives that bring him to do Avodah Zarah. He has, he has uh, too much wealth, too many horses, and so on. Um, against the law of the king and uh, of the kings in Sefer Devarim, and so I think that this story um, is bringing King Shalomo and Ashmedai one replacing the other, and no one can tell the difference between well, which one is Ash, which one is the head demon, and which one is King Shalomo. The fact that people can't tell means that okay, there is something similar about them, and even though Ashmedai has good qualities, he is still a demon, and he does these terrible things with um, the the queens, um, and they can makes us, I think, think about uh, the reign of King Shalomo, although he also did great things like build the Bet HaMikdash, um, uh, but through that actually, you know, kind of inter intertwined, very through the very act of building the Bet HaMikdash and finding Shamir and doing it in the right way, he kind of, he had to get Ashmedai, okay, fine, that's justified, but then he abused that power and kept, uh, kept Ashmedai and was curious about the dark arts and said, oh, can you show me what this is? And so his, uh, you know, curiosity uh, killed the king, you might say, or at least opposed him temporarily. Um, all right, really fantastic and interesting story. The really main, main theme of the whole thing is a commentary on Kohelet about the futility of materialism. And now you can build everything and have uh, all the power and riches in the world, um, but still how fleeting it is. In one second, you can lose everything. And that's not really where value is. All right, true uh, value is in goodness, in Torah, in wisdom, in mitzvot, in helping blind people and helping, um, uh, helping uh, a bride and a widow, um, and, right? That's, that's where that um, true, um, true value and uh, permanence uh, really lies. All right, fantastic, deep and interesting and fun story. And now we'll just end off with a little bit more of uh, medical advice. Lidama de resha. If someone has a headache because a lot of blood in his head, lete shurbina ubina ve asadara ve zeta ve chilfa ve chilfe de yama ve yabla ve lish lukin ube adada de velintol telat mea kase ahai gisa de resha o telat mea kase ahai gisa de resha. A person that he should bring cypress, willow, fresh myrtle, olive, poplar, sea willow, cyanodon, grass, and boil them together, pour 300 cups of liquid on this side of his head and 300 on that other side of his head, and if you don't have a headache by then, 
No, then then your headache will go away. Veila lete vardachi varta vekaebe had dada. If you can't get all those ingredients, here's something simpler. Just get a white rose that white rose that uh, grows by itself in its own row. Velishkele. Boil it and pour 60 cups of that boiled um, rose water on this side of the head and 60 on the other side. If someone has a migraine, they should bring a wild rooster. Again, with the wild rooster, slaughter it using a silver dinar, and um, the blood will go over the side of his head. That, that that hurts him if he has a migraine, uh, but be careful that the blood doesn't go into his eye because that will blind the person. Again, another th- theme about blind people um, is uh, as we saw in the previous two stories. And then you take the rooster, hang it on the doorpost so that when he enters, he rubs against it. And when he leaves, he also rubs against that rooster. And hopefully that will help his migraine. And here is this wild rooster uh, hupo uh, that we've been speaking about this whole time. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.